News Channel 5 Network, this is Morning Line with Nick Barris. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us on Morning Line. Nick Barris on this wet Wednesday in downtown Nashville. Sit back and enjoy the program this morning. You're welcome to join in the conversation either here on the Plus. You're watching right now. We'll get the phone number up if you want to call. And if you want to message us as well, I'm following uh, as we go along on Facebook as we do. Uh, it's uh, going to be at Facebook, newschannel5.com. If you want to go to that and join in the conversation with us this morning, um, message us along those lines. We've got... Uh, uh, several interesting topics to discuss with our guest this morning. He's a regular and has been for some time now. Davidson County Sheriff Darren Hall is now joining us live and direct. Sheriff, where are you and what are those footballs over your right shoulder? <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm in my office at my house and uh, I guess this looks like uh, the walls are kind of bare. So I thought, well, there's a corner of the room and uh, I think there's a ball from maybe when I was the president of ACA. It looks like oh, okay. I forget my son was a was a high school quarterback here in town. Loved football, so we traveled all over the country with that. And uh, so a lot of this is his stuff, I guess. But uh, a place to a place to sit and have a meeting, I guess. Well, I see, and you've got a, a, a panoramic shot of I guess Neyland Stadium right behind you, right? Actually, that is Lambeau Field. Oh, is it Lambeau? Kid, okay, I, I thought I saw orange in there. So that's the Green Bay Packers, Lambeau Field. That's awesome, too. Yeah, I'm a Titans fan, but I, I grew up a Packer fan. My granddad went to the first Super Bowl, first championship game, and I, I grew up loving the Packers and got to go up there when the Tennessee Oilers played, I guess, years ago. So, yep. Uh, but yeah, my loyalty's still here as soon as we get back to playing. Yeah, no kidding. Well, listen, it's good to see you, and yeah, you're looking well. Just have uh, several things to touch bases on with you this morning. Some COVID-related, and some are related to that crazy case involving Mark Friedman with some new developments yesterday. We'll get into that in just a moment, and, and we'll take phone calls, and people can message. Let me ask you first. Um, you know, we're in the phase in. I see that um, you each day, and I forget what the numbers were yesterday, each week rather update you know, any COVID cases behind bars in the Davidson County Jail. Where do we stand? And, and have you seen any trend one way or the other, whether or not they've increased? Yeah, so we, we've had a total of 21 inmates positive uh, over the period of time, and um, and all of those have recovered. So today we're, we're at what we call zero uh, positives, but we have some 31 inmates that are in restrictions, basically, either symptomatic awaiting results or tested and awaiting results and so that's kind of a we're, we're awaiting some of those numbers but we have not seen that uh you know that that huge spike uh, we had some some advantages that were just built in it was luck to be honest with you nick because you knew we had the new building we're opening we could use it to separate people and so there's a lot of things luck in the sense of, of facilities but our staff worked extremely hard our medical provider has been it's been, a, in my time, probably the, the most challenging housing environment I've ever seen. And, uh, um, you know, there's been many other airborne diseases and things that we deal with, and from scabies to, you know, lice to things that are very contagious, and but nothing like, uh, nothing like this. And uh, we've also had nine staff positive, and um, six of those have recovered, and, and, and but we have three that, that are still home. and. Um, you know, I've been saying this a long time, and I, and I hope people don't get offended by it, but, you know, the police and fire personnel in our country and our community are, are, are always do a di very difficult job and very challenging. But, but to be honest with you, the first responder terminology uh, is, is overused in this case. Um, to me, uh, a health care provider where you're housing people who are sick or a long-term care facility where you're housing older people who have become sick, or a jail or prison are far more difficult than the front line. And I know it's popular and politically popular to talk about, you know, police fire because their job is out in the streets and it's, it's typically very dangerous and difficult. And even in this case, there's danger involved with arresting a person that might be COVID, but it's nowhere near the difficulty of housing 1,000 people of which several hundred become positive. So. Uh, I just want to uh, just, just a shout out to all the people who are working in jails and prisons who don't really get the credit they deserve on a daily basis. But in this situation, and I have said this from the beginning, um, it is far more difficult. Um, we've had the most staff positive in the entire government. Uh, our staff don't make what police officers make. 
uh, or fire personnel, and and um, but they deserve more credit than they des- than they're getting in, in situations like this. You see a lot of things called first responders. Well, corrections people aren't first responders, uh, but they are doing a, a a yeoman's task in in the, in the most difficult of situations, and really don't get the credit they deserve. It's uh, it, it's an incredibly difficult situation, and uh, that's not picking on the police. They have dangerous jobs. Uh, for fear of being shot and harmed and sued and all the things that go into the world of policing. Uh, but in this case, uh, the people who are in a much more difficult environment are the people who are in jails and prisons working and living uh, and also hospitals and, 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 and uh, long-term care health facilities. And yeah. uh, I like my friends in the police and fire departments, but they're getting more credit in this situation than, 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 than they probably deserve. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you said that because it is a difficult situation. We hear so much about maybe the inmates and keeping them safe and have it spread, but you got to forget all the, the employees you have that are in there with them, and it's about keeping them all protected. And, and to that regard, I'm just curious at this point, um, as things stand, first of all, do you have most, or are you still in the process of moving all the inmates to the new facility now? Or, you know, how far before, you know, you make that transition fully from out in Harding Place? Yeah, Nick, and, and probably the, the bigger disappointment in all of this is uh, that we've had to back our way in to, to the new facility just because of the way it's all played out. I know we'll talk about Friedman here in a minute, too, but you know, but with that event that started, and then of course COVID came right on the heels of that, uh, we've actually, I keep calling it backed our way in. What we really did was we opened it up as a medical facility for two to three weeks. It feels like uh, that's, I forget exactly what day we started that, but we moved the folks who were positive or needed to be isolated into the facility first, and then slowly but surely, and as we speak today, I think there's nearly 500 people over there um, and it's fully functioning. Uh, we, okay. we, uh, we, we op- opened it up on Mother's Day was the actual day of our first booking and processing. And so, yeah, it, it's operating the way it should be. It just, we just got there in a unique way and uh, fantastic facility and, and, and our staff uh, are doing a great job in, in, a, in a, an unusual time, but uh, it, it's up and running. Okay, and, and the other question, and I know you may have dealt with this some, other jails and some of the prisons continue to talk about it, and we hear about it from folks with loved ones behind bars. Um, do you know, have you had any more early releases? Is that something you're still processing as you hear from a DA or a judge that here's an individual that's been locked up, uh, he's near the end of his sentence, and he's 60 years old, um, let's just get him out of there. I mean, have some of those happened with you, as we've heard at some of the other jails, even though I think it's gone into slower process, we, we know that it's not a blanket thing, it's case by case. How about with you guys? guys yeah it's a really good question we we um just just to kind of put a baseline out there we we were we would probably you would have expected us to be around 1300 people in in jail today um that, that's probably the number we would be at had this not happened uh instead we're around 950 and so just just to know that there's you know 300 or so plus that are not in custody today uh, some of those a lot of those are just awaiting trial from from the streets or were released on pretrial release and other programs and so and there were some that that were released via the court um you know letting their sentence expire earlier and so um and then the police are writing more citations and so a lot of that has reduced the number coming in but there are on ongoing conversations with the with the district attorney's office and the, and the public defender's office when we have high risk cases or people coming in the system or, or obviously involved but uh i had asked just just kind of a uh somewhat of an arbitrary number. We needed to get our population down so we could spread people out in our beds and uh, we needed to get it down around a thousand. And so we were at 1300 at one point and we're down, uh, like I said, now the facility's open. We're, we're really re- functioning almost in a normal and housing situation, except for some of those people that are restricted. But uh, uh, we're nervous like everybody else that, that if you get a positive case or two inside of our facility, it can quickly turn into a hundred or so uh, and, and that's very dangerous and d- difficult to deal with. So um, there's not as much of an effort to early release anymore. I think everyone's just kind of open-minded as we go. Uh, uh, if we have certain cases we need to we need to work on. All right, listen, Sheriff, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, uh, we'll open up the phone lines, uh, take a couple calls for you, and then we're going to jump in. Stick around, everyone, because when we come back, it is 
a plot from a movie, and it's going to. And we're going to talk about if and when this movie is made, who is going to play the sheriff <laughs> and others. But, I mean, the, the, the story behind this Alex Friedman case and the weapons being hidden in the newly constructed jail, um, just amazing. We learned more yesterday as um, now Friedman is facing some additional charges f at the federal level. But, boy, stick around for that, and, you know, the sheriff will go into more detail. That's just mind-boggling. So we'll be back with more right after this. Stay with us.